And who are you? George Clooney finds himself facing some powerful and potentially deadly forces. I'm Richard Roper. And I'm Robert Wolanski. Okay, first up is Michael Clayton. It's one of my favorite movies of the year. There are multiple Oscar contenders in this movie. Clooney has become a master of balancing money-making mega-projects like the Oceans films with prestige films such as Good Night and Good Luck and Syriana. Here he gives one of his most complete performances as the title character. He's a so-called janitor or fix-it man for an upper-tier law firm. It's kind of like a more polished version of the Mr. Wolf character from Pulp Fiction. There's no play here. There's no angle, there's no champagne room. I'm not a miracle worker, I'm a janitor. The math on this is simple. The smaller the mess, the easier it is for me to clean up. Tom Wilkinson deserves serious Best Supporting Actor consideration as Arthur Edens. He's a brilliant and ruthless litigator who has a moment of crystal revelation and then suffers a breakdown. I have blood on my hands. You are the senior litigating partner of one of the largest, most respected law firms in the world. You are a legend. I'm an accomplice. You are a manic depressive. I am Shiva, the god of death. Tilda Swinton is brilliant as the chief counsel for a huge agrochemical company. Their product turned out to be poisonous. They hired Arthur and his firm to defend a potentially crippling lawsuit. She's willing to do anything to stop Arthur's crusade. This is a $3 billion class action lawsuit. In the morning, I have to call my board. I have to tell them that the architect of our entire defense has been arrested for running naked in a snowstorm, chasing the plaintiffs through a parking lot. Sidney Pollack is one of our most respected directors, and he's the go-to character actor to play men of great authority and unwavering confidence. He plays the head of Arthur and Michael's law firm. What would they do? What would they do if he went public? They're doing it. We don't straighten the settlement out in the next 24 hours. They're going to withhold $9 million in fees. Then they're going to pull out the video of Arthur doing his flash dance in Milwaukee. They're going to sue us for legal malpractice. Except there won't be anything from the wind because by then the merger with London will be dead. We'll be selling off the furniture. Directed by Tony Gilroy, the screenwriter for the Jason Bourne movies, Michael Clayton is a near classic of the conspiracy genre. Michael Clayton is told in flashbacks, and the first half hour is particularly confusing. But even as I waited for the pieces to come together, and they do come together, I was exhilarated by the mastery of the script, the direction, and the acting. This movie opens in limited release this weekend. It goes wide next week. I love this film, Robert. I have to agree with you. Absolutely agree with you. And I think it's amazing. This is Tony Gilroy's first directorial effort. Mm. Here's a guy who started out writing The Cutting Edge, that ice skating movie that was clearly a really? predecessor to... Wow. Blades of Glory. Yeah, exactly. I remember. And I, I think it's astounding what he's made here. This is the perfect John Grisham movie. This is what you wish all those Grisham no, movies right. had been. Right. Yeah. And it really gets to the core of, of sort of what makes these people tick and what makes them broken. One thing that's amazing, I think, about Clooney is we never see him fixing anything. By the time we get to Michael Clayton, he's actually kind of a broken he's guy. He's kind of a broken guy himself, yeah. Sort absolutely. of at the very beginning of the movie, he's brought in to sort of fix a suburban drunk driving charge. Yeah, and that's he a can't good, even take care of that. And that's a good scene that shows us that he's kind of at a crossroads there because even there, it's not exactly as if his heart is all the way into this because right. he, he is kind of, you know, he's got so many demons of his own. He's but broke. Even, yeah, yeah, he's got, you know, he's in debt. He's got his own problems with his family and his brothers and all this stuff going on. But even with like the Till the Swinton character, who's the, you know, the prototypical, like, you know, bad guy, if you will, we see scenes of her getting ready for her day and, and how, you know, nerves are affecting her and how, you know, it's kind of behind the scenes things that we don't usually see. And incredibly in, unflattering you know. shots of her. I mean, the, the scene it's a, of her it's in the a bathroom, she's sweaty, she's yeah. put on a few pounds. It's sort of all these people are at their end. And, and we haven't mentioned the fact that the White Shadow is really good in this. Ken Howard yeah, Ken is Howard. really good. Uh, lots, of, lots of, you know, uh, perfect scenes for the character actors in here. And it's just such a classic uh, quality piece of filmmaking from the director, the script, and this great cast. Well, from the deep and heavy to the shallow and light, <laughs> our next movie is an old-fashioned coming-of-age story called December Boys. Based on a novel, it's about four Australian orphans given a reprieve from their bleak existence when they're sent to the seaside for a holiday in the sun. And though there are four lads here, one in particular will garner the most attention, and with good reason. Harry Potter himself, Daniel Radcliffe, is Maps, the oldest of the quartet, and the one who finds himself with a temporary girlfriend named Lucy, who is no Hermione Granger. What about you? And you good at anything? I know it's not singing. Well, I don't want to be adopted. What's the big deal about parents anyway? I could make all kinds of magic wand jokes here, but instead I'll just tell you the names of the other three boys. Kristen Byers plays Spark, James Fraser plays Spit, and adorable Lee Cormie plays Misty for you. During their stay in paradise, the boys live with a kindly elderly couple who treat them like the parents they've never had. What is it? 
I don't suppose you've seen one of these, but uh, every ship has one. It's called a gyroscope. Keeps your vessel balanced. Almost unexpectedly, I have to admit, I was charmed and moved by a movie that most will recall only for Harry Potter's deflowering. Well, I was not charmed, I was not moved, and you're right, it is overly, overly, overly familiar. And I knew we were in trouble as soon as I got those cutesy nicknames for all the young lads, and that summer they'll never forget. Right. And, you know, Daniel Radcliffe, I think he's okay here, but, Robert, you know, there's this whole main story about who's going to get adopted by the, you know, the nice little young couple next door. But, you know, Daniel Radcliffe, he looks like he's about 18, so what does he want to get adopted for six weeks? I mean, that makes no sense. But he doesn't and want to be adopted. That's the thing about his character. He, he doesn't want well, to be adopted. Well, but, that, but not because he's too old. And that's, that's just a quibble because the rest of the stuff is just, you know, overly, we've seen it a million times before. And I have to say, even at the end of the film, and I don't think this is really giving anything away too much, but, you know, you see the characters years and years later, but the timeline's all screwed up and all the guys are 25 years too old that to be was playing a, that, that part. And if they don't again. care enough to get that right, I think they don't care enough to get the rest of it right. So I think it's, it's, it's inoffensive. It passes the time, but it's certainly not worth rushing to the theaters to see. Fair enough. Well, later in the show, Ben Stiller is the heartbreak kid. And next, Maria Bello and Emily Blunt join the Jane Austen Book Club. Mean things Austen is the capital of Texas. People our age don't fall in love. I mean, I've never even been in love. You've never been in love? I had sexual partners. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't mind falling in love, but it just almost seems like fiction to me anyway. Okay, for some guys, the Jane Austen book club sounds like instant kryptonite. And yes, you could definitely categorize this as an extra chicky chick flick. But you know what? It's also smart, engaging, and funny. And I liked it a lot. Based on the popular novel, the movie is split into six sections titled after Austen's novels. Even as the characters dive into the book discussions with gusto, they're living out some dramas that play out exactly like a Jane Austen novel. I think she'd be all women. But I mean, men, they pontificate, and no one can get a word in each one. Well, I, I mean, think if you... In, but men, they keep murmuring, yammer, 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 and we keep listening, protecting their feelings. But if... And men don't do book clubs. And that's Kathy Baker. She's pitch perfect here as Bernadette. She's one of those women who's a life force, which is most of the time a good thing. And Emily Blunt plays the very uptight teacher. They're among the charter members of the Jane Austen Book Club. And then there's Maggie Gray. She played a spoiled brat on Lost, and she's just marvelous here as Bernadette's lesbian daughter. My dad left them all. Oh, pretty is no stranger to marital disappointment. But actually, we're fine now. You're married? But no ring, huh? That's this hand. Um, I teach French. You teach French, so you wear your wedding ring on the right hand. It's a European custom. Are you European? Also very excellent here, Maria Bello and Amy Brenneman. In fact, there are a few false acting notes in the Jane Austen book club. Now, I didn't much care for Becoming Jane, the movie this year about Jane Austen, but the Jane Austen book club, that's worth attending. I would watch it if it were on Lifetime, which is, I'm stunned that it's actually not released directly to Lifetime. Yeah. I found it really boring and incredibly on the nose. And yes, there are great actresses, some of whom give very good performances. I think Maria Bello uh -huh. is the older woman in love with the younger man, though she refuses to admit it. Yeah. And keeps Hugh trying Dancy, to, who's very Hugh good. Dancy as, is yeah, great. Yeah. He's really good in it. I think he I think all the performances are great. Mm -hmm. I love Jimmy Smith in it as well. But I found that at the end of the day I didn't connect with any of them because it's all so cozy, comfy and convenient. Every plot point Every book discussed, it all well, feels so contrived I, and manipulative. I get, what, I get what you're saying, and it is a little too, you know, cozy and comfortable. We're not going to get pushed around too much. But I think, you know, there are some, some loose ends and some, some uncomfortable scenes just enough. And I, and I have to say, Robert, I mean, all due respect to Lifetime movies, I think this is a, a cut above with the script and certainly the quality, oxygen, the quality of this cast. No, even better than Oxygen. But, you know, I, I get what you're saying. It is comfortable. It's, an, it's kind of, an, you know, an easy, uh, not a film that's going to challenge you a lot. But I think with the acting and with a lot of the performances. And I, and I actually think the script is better than that. I think it's better than you're giving credit Look, for. I do celebrate movies that celebrate books. Mm. I think that's one thing that's wonderful about this. I do like the shots of people reading. I think that's a very daring choice to make. It really is. You're right. Really, yeah. I mean, it sounds funny, but you're right. It actually is. slow a sucker uh, down. And, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe it'd be, you know, more interesting if we had the Stephen King book club, because that might be a more <laughs> diverse group of people, right? All right, coming up next. Ben Stiller and the Farrelly brothers reunite in the Heartbreak Kid. But first, here's another review.
review from the Balcony Archive, where you can watch 20 years of movie reviews at atthemoviestv.com. Well, he has some, this borderline kind of misogynistic he's attitude. Issues, he's got yeah. some issues with women. I don't think it's and really then borderline. And it's like an island of like, you know, yeah. crazy vegan shrews that hate men. Yeah, I don't, think, the, it's, I don't, think, I don't think he has borderline you know, misogynist I mean, issues. I think he's, he's redefined he's the border of that. date, I think, yeah. with a nice lady <laughs> and get so. a couple of hugs. Allow us to help your men go catch this criminal. All right, looking at movies now in theaters, I like the man, the Darjeeling Limited. Robert didn't, but he did like the game plan, and history will never forgive him for that. You know, I believe the game plan kicked the crap out of the kingdom at the box office, so America clearly thinks that I'm smarter than you. <laughs> well, next up is The Heartbreak Kid, a remake of a film no one ever needed to remake, least of all Peter and Bobby Fairley, who are clearly eager after their soft-in-the-head remake of Fever Pitch to prove themselves still capable of eliciting yucks out of yuck. The Farrelly's re-team with the star of There's Something About Mary, Ben Stiller, who looks like he'd rather be anywhere than here most of the time. Stiller is Eddie Cantro, a sporting goods store owner in San Francisco who, after 40 years of bachelorhood, gives in to his father's demands and finds himself a nice girl, so he thinks at least, played by Malin Ackerman. Only after just a few hours of marriage, Lila is beginning to get on Eddie's nerves. She's getting on ours, too. By the time they get to Mexico on their honeymoon, Ben decides he has had enough. Hey, we're newlyweds. We just want to have a quiet time together. How can we have any good memories if you guys keep... Eddie, 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 it's okay. I am... Eddie, it's okay. Alas, salvation arrives in the form of down-home Mississippi gal Miranda, played by Michelle Moynihan. Indeed, they're so comfy together that folks mistake them for newlyweds. Are you here on your honeymoon? Actually, I am. You having a good time? Uh, <laughs> we're having an incredible time. We're having the time of our lives. <laughs> what are you doing down here? Why don't you go to your room? Uh, Fans of the original movie, which is based on a great, great Bruce J. Friedman short story, might see the trailer for this and think the Heartbreak Kid is just a wacky updating. But it's so much more, by which I mean it is so, so much less. Juvenile and pedestrian and just plain cruel, especially to Ackerman's character, it's bereft any of the subtlety and ache and misery that permeated the original, which played in a lot of ways like a companion piece to The Graduate. This sophomoric version, which actually finds room for Carlos Mencia and Flo from the old TV series Alice, mm. wouldn't even make it out of grade school alive. It's a piece of bleep. I mean, it really <laughs> is. I'll bleep myself out here, Robert. It's so horrible. And, you know, sometimes the Farrelly brothers, it can be really funny when they do all the gross out stuff, but they're just repeating a lot of the gags we've seen before with, you know, skin breaking out and hideous things. And, and these and gags... He has the worst humiliation and, and, possible. And, they, and, you know, and, you know, and it just falls flat, flat, flat. And he finds out all these horrible things about, uh, you know, his his brand new bride. Well, what was he doing during the six weeks they were courting? Did he not pay attention to any of that? That makes no sense. Plus, he is a jerk. Even though, yes, yeah, she's insufferable and, you know, obviously it's a mismatch. He's a jerk. Everything he does is jerky and annoying. He's creepy. And everything, of course, hinges on one of those little sitcom misunderstandings that would be cleared up in about a five-minute conversation. Every step of the way is a wrong step. It really does have that threes company misunderstanding yeah. where you just go, uh, wait, he didn't mean that, she didn't mean that, you've got to be kidding me. And then you get one of those unnecessary cameos at the end where people are going, is that a recognizable star? I think it's her, but it makes no sense and it just drags it on. Which comes after a cameo by something no one should ever show in a movie you are, ever. You are right about I, that. I and just that, beg yeah. people not Disgusting. to see it for this one 10 second sequence. Oof. I have a great sense of humor. I don't mind body. I don't mind risque. Yeah. I don't mind nasty. It's just stupid. We move on <laughs> to uh, uh, a much less offensive junkie movie. It's called The Seeker. <laughs> Now, this is based on the second in the five-part book series from Susan Cooper, and it's a muddled and unsatisfying time travel adventure. Apparently, they've made a lot of changes for the movie version. Whatever they've done, it seems as if we're joining a journey that has already begun. Alexander Ludwig plays Will Stanton, an American boy living with his large family in London. On his 14th birthday, Will learns he's the seeker. That means he must lead the forces of light against, you guessed it, the forces of darkness we the old ones we serve the light the rider he serves the dark the dark is rising you it is you who must restore the power of the light um i'm sorry miss Crayform, but 
Maybe you got the wrong guy. Christopher Eccleston is something less than frightening as the rider. He seems to be the only soldier in the Army of Darkness. This guy's not even as scary as some of the weirder instructors at Hogwarts. Ian McShane plays Merriman, who spends a lot of time telling Will that the fate of the world rests with him. You can command fire. Light! Awesome. Move objects. Summon great strength. Can I fly? What? You know. Whoosh. For most of the movie, Will goes on a scavenger hunt through time. He's collecting the so-called signs, which look like trinkets you would buy at neighborhood art fairs. It's never explained what will really happen if the dark side triumphs. Apparently the world will end, but then where would the rider and his horse go? There's no world left. What's the point in destroying the world if you're part of the world? We also get confusing subplots involving Will's siblings, his slightly off-kilter dad, and a mysterious girl whose real intentions will be obvious to anyone over 12. The acting is mediocre, the story rambles, the special effects average at best, so I'm saying no, no, no. You know what happens if darkness triumphs? What? You actually have to go see The Seeker again. <laughs> Ooh, that's a cruel world. You know, it's just such a weird, chintzy movie it based is. on what is actually a Newbery Award-winning book. Yeah. The second book. I know I there are a lot of huge fans of this book Absolutely. Series, yeah. People were really looking forward to this. I know that there's a huge cult. I read the books when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. They're great books. I think people are going to see this and go, this is just a ripoff of Harry Potter, it's just a ripoff of Star Wars and all of these other things, light and dark. But it actually is sort of a forerunner to all of that. And then to come and make a movie about it, to just trash it, and yeah. to just do it in such a low-rent, sophomoric kind of way. Well, it's so cheaply done, and even though you do have people like Ian McShane, who's a very good actor, you almost feel as if, you know, if this thing goes away, maybe more talented, better qualified people will take, you know, tackle this book series again somewhere down the road. We can only hope. Well, the time travel sequences themselves are amazing. It's literally just a camera spinning around and they end up on a studio back lot for like 10 <laughs> it's seconds. kind of like, doodle -doodle. we're back in time now. All right. All right, coming up next, Sir Ben Kingsley is a hitman in love with Taya Leone, who can blame him. That's in our video segment. But first, here's a look at what's coming up on next week's show. All that matters is that we finish this. By God, England will not fall while I am queen. All right, looking at movies new on DVD, I liked Happy Feet. I hated Evan Almighty and didn't much care for Rain Over Me. A movie I really liked, Robert, that was one of those under-the-radar specials, You Kill Me. Ben Kingsley once again playing a hitman. You know, ever since Gandhi, he's played a hitman like a half a dozen times, but he's great at it. it. And in You Kill Me, he's an alcoholic hitman and yet somehow likable, and we believe that Taya Leone would fall in love with him, and Luke Wilson is kind of his mentor helping him through AA. It was one of those things, I think, with, you know, with Analyze This and The Sopranos, We've seen conflicted mobster hitmen right. several times, but it's still well done. It's dark, it's funny, and strangely moving, and I just love Sir Ben when he plays a hitman. He's great. It's the feel-good version of Sexy Beast. Nicely done. Hey, it is. Thanks. Exactly. That's what I'm here for. Help us out with another pick, please. I will. You know, speaking of the heartbreak kid, as mm. we were trying not to just moments ago, right. I am amazed at how few folks actually know that the Ben Stiller version is a remake of a 1972 movie. Mm. Maybe that's because it's so dang hard to find a DVD of Elaine May's original, which has been released released twice on DVD in recent years, but has since gone out of print. Charles Grodin would never be as great again as he was here as a newlywed who ditches his fresh missus, played by the Oscar-nominated Jeannie Berlin, for a golden goddess from Minnesota, played by a luminous Sybil Shepherd. You can do anything you like. Anything? I think you're ready for my test. Terrific. So come on, please, somebody, give this a proper release already. I begged Criterion for Bottle Rocket a few weeks ago, and we got word this week that that's going to happen. So why not the Heartbreak Kid, somebody? Yeah, isn't it amazing if you wish for things on this show, it comes true. This you found out magic. the secret. That's how Natalie Portman became my housekeeper. It's amazing, <laughs> the things you wish for, but you can only get three per season. So uh -oh, I keep don't want to use mind. them up. All right, so You Kill Me will be in stores on Tuesday. The original Heartbreak Kid is out there, but it's hard to find. Hopefully it'll get a re-release in better format soon. And we'll be back to recap this week's show right after this. Closed captioning for Ebert and Roper is sponsored by... Man has evolved to the point where he no longer needs to stand in line for tickets. The Movie Tickets card, available only at MovieTickets.com. Guests of Ebert and Roper stay at the Peninsula Chicago, the city's most exciting luxury hotel, located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile. Okay, recapping the movies on this week's show. We both loved Michael Clayton. Robert liked December Boys. I didn't. I liked the Jane Austen book club. Robert didn't. 
neither of us cared for the Heartbreak Kid or the Seeker. I think obviously the biggest movie in terms of commercial potential is the Heartbreak Kid this weekend. But we warned folks, we warned you. Well, when people walk out of Heartbreak Kid, 15, 20 minutes in, they can go see Michael Clayton instead. Well played, well played. That's it for this week. Until next week, the balcony is closed. think a prune is a prune, you haven't tried new Sunsweet Ones. How do you like the individual wrappers? It's not dry at all. They're delicious. New Sunsweet <laughs> Ones. Bite for bite, even better than fresh fruit. Net Zero gives you the fastest surfing available over dial-up and virus protection starting at $9.95. Try it risk-free for 30 days with our money-back guarantee.